Welcome to this edition of CFS Conversations. And today we are extremely honored, delighted, and excited to be joined by the Chief Economic Empowerment at UN Women, all the way from the UN headquarters in New York. And this is none other than Dr. Jemima Njoki. Dr. Njoki, it's good to have you here with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Fantastic. Dr. Njoki, you have come quite a long way to join us here in Rome this week where we are convening the 50th session of the UN Committee on World Food Security, CFS. And you are meeting against some very worrying uh, backdrop, a backdrop of billions of people going to bed hungry, billions of people who cannot afford or access healthy diets. What's the outlook from where you sit at UN Women? So at UN Women, we're looking at this as a multiple crisis because we were barely out of uh, the COVID crisis and then we have a food crisis at the moment. We have a cost of living crisis, uh, especially because of the rise in energy prices. So it's not just food, it's, it's energy access. Um, and we are especially concerned about the devastating impacts that it's having on millions of people around the world. We know that the number of hungry people has uh, continued to go up steadily. We were at about 800 million people early in the year. We know that number has now, um, has now grown. We keep, uh, we're continually concerned about those that had lost their jobs during COVID because it's made, them, uh, it's made it much more difficult uh, for them to live through this crisis. We are concerned about the impact of the climate crisis, especially in countries in the Horn of Africa. So it's really a compounding crisis that we are, we are, we are talking about. And one of the things that we are really concerned about is that we don't just think of this as a crisis of numbers, because it's very easy to think about it's 800 million people or it's a billion people. But behind those numbers are actually people's lives and people's uh, livelihoods. And so at UN Women, we really want to, to have that face of the, of the crisis so that as leaders, we are continually reminded of what we have to do to improve our food systems, to make sure that those food systems are delivering uh, nutritious foods, that they are delivering adequate livelihoods, and they are delivering uh, decent lives for people around the world. It's a very interesting way of putting it, Dr. Njoki, which you say it's just not numbers, it's faces of human beings, people, mothers, fathers, children who are suffering. And I had someone say earlier in the room that women are often the shock absorbers of society, so they choose to either eat less or eat less so that everyone can have something to eat. What does this look like um, on, on women of the world, especially the most marginalized? So we know even during times of peace, you know, during no, you know, drought or, or floods, no conflict, the women still are disproportionately affected by, by hunger. There's a gender gap in food insecurity that has also been growing steadily. In 2019, we had a gender gap of about 1.7 percentage points. In 2021, and that is before the, the crisis in Ukraine, that gap rose to 4%. And it might look like a very small gap, but it means that 150 million more women than men are hungry today. And those are huge numbers. Now, at household level, we, as, as you say, what we see is women eating less, women eating last. It has a lot of impact on their, on their well-being. But much more importantly, it's not just a crisis of, of, of food. Because when, what happens when uh, households are hungry, there's increased violence. So from a gender perspective, and as UN women, we're not just looking at the impacts on food security and nutrition per se, but also some of the compounding impacts that happen as a result of that. So we see increased violence in households. We see girls being married off because families cannot afford to feed them. 
we see increased incidences of sexual trafficking, especially when households become uh, desperate. So for us, it's looking at all these um, broad impacts that we are seeing as a result of the, of the crisis. But we also want to focus on solutions. So part of what we have been contributing, especially to the global crisis response group, is to say, OK, these are the impacts on women and girls. But how should the world respond? How should governments respond to this crisis? So we are asking government to prioritize the right to food for women and girls and, and, and marginalized, uh, marginalized people. We are asking that we invest much more in making our food systems more equitable in the, in the long run. That we invest more in local food systems um, where women actually are much more engaged and that actually have potential to feed people in instances where global food supply chains are, are compromised. We are asking government to invest in, in social protection because some of the short-term measures require that people actually food, put food on the table. And so social protection, uh, expanding social protection, uh, whether that's cash uh, transfer programs, whether that's uh, conditional or non-conditional. Non but what we are also asking is what we call expanding social protection flaws, making sure that those that haven't been reached by social protection before, including women, including gender diverse people, because they are not on government records, because the census isn't collecting that kind of data, that they expand the social protection flaws to make sure they are reaching all the marginalized people that social protection needs to, needs to meet. But more importantly, we are asking for long-term investments. We have to build the resilience of our food systems, and that starts with investing in, in women, making sure that women have access to resources, they can own land, they can utilize that, that land, that they have access to capital, they have access to climate smart technologies. Because in the long term, we are past this crisis, we have to prepare for the next crisis. And, and we know that it's not an if the next crisis happens, we know it's going to happen. So the question is when, and are we going to be ready? Um, for that? Are we building the resilience today that doesn't get us to the point where we are, um, where we are now? I like how you have pivoted uh, towards the more optimistic, um, solutions-oriented um, nature of the you know, work that we're doing. And this is why I bring in CFS, uh, Jemima, because uh, you and women is a key um, supporter of the work that um, CFS is doing, and especially uh, as far as gender equality, women's and girls' empowerment is concerned for food security and nutrition. I would like to hear a little more from you um, about how do you see CFS play a role in this space as a platform where multiple uh, partners come together with governments uh, to debate, negotiate difficult issues. What, what do you see as a place of CFS and the support that you and women is giving? So let me f first start by commending CFS uh, just in starting this work stream on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls in the context of food and nutrition security. Because as somebody who's worked on issues of gender equality in food systems, our work has been very, very marginal to the general debates that happen around food systems. And so for CFS to actually bring that into its normal working processes and working groups, I think is really, really important. And for me, I see it as such a, a, um, a follow-up to some of the discussions we had at the UN Food System Summit and why it's really important to put gender equality and women's empowerment at the center of food systems uh, transformation. And we know, I think the evidence is so clear. Um, I actually say we, we don't need to speak about the why. We know gender equality, food systems um, are intertwined. You cannot achieve one. You cannot achieve food security without thinking about gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. Not just because of the roles that women play, 
but also some of the barriers that we know they face that we need to close and that we know we need to, to close, including norms around issues of land and, and so on. So I see the CFS as a really important space because you have member states and, and, and when you have something appoint, uh, you know, adopted by member states, you sort of provide this framework for which more than 100, 150 countries can actually act. This, it, it triggers global action on some of these issues. So we are not starting and working, you know, a woman at a time because we will never get there if we have to work a woman at a time. You're basically getting governments to adopt policy responses that actually can have impact at, at global scale. It's been very important for us as UN women to engage uh, with the CFS because, of course, um, working uh, with and for women around the world, we know a majority of those women are rural women or women living in rural areas, women who depend on food systems as producers, as processors, as distributors, as, as, um, as consumers. And so rural women are a big constituent of the work. Um, the work that we do. And so we see the CFS as a partner for us to be able to, to, to make sure that we are impacting on, on women. The second reason why this is so important to us is, as you know, every year we hold the Commission on the Status of Women and every year we negotiate with member states around different aspects. This year we were negotiating around climate change and how to make climate action more gender responsive. So we would like to bring all that experience, including experience from the Beijing platform, which was very transformational in many, many ways, to bear on what CFS is trying to achieve. And for us, at a minimum, we say we have a grid language. You will have had member states and a lot of others talk about you know, a grid language. We want to keep making progress. So we want that a grid language to be the minimum where we start and negotiate so that we are seeing um, we are seeing progress and through CFS we actually want to see some progress in some of the language that we have um, on gender equality and and women uh, the empowerment of women and girls in in food systems I like the strategic direction you're starting <laughs> to chat Dr. Njoke for unlocking this process the optimism that you um, speak with, and I'm um, afraid we'll have to wrap it up um, here, but it would be remiss of me to go without saying this is your birthday week. Oh, and yes. with the cameras rolling, <laughs> I'll say happy, happy birthday. Thank Jemima. you so much. Thank Absolutely. you so much. I now have more years behind me than I have ahead, so it also gives me a lot of impetus to make sure what I do now has meaning. Dr. Njoki. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate Thank it. you for having me. Absolutely.